Welcome to the Right Science Daily Revision Boost. In today's Biology Blast, we're going to go over some of our sampling work. First thing we need to know are four key words and their meanings. So distribution is where species are found over the total area where they occur. Population, the number of organisms of a species in a given area. Relationship is the interaction between species living in the same area and sampling is where we count a small number of a larger total population in order to carry out a study on it. So there are seven techniques we need to know about for carrying out this sampling. First one, quadrats. Those are a square of a known area that we will place on the ground randomly and count the plants inside. Pooters in the bottom left. These are used to collect small invertebrates so that we can then identify them and count them later. Pitfall traps in the bottom right there, so that's a jar buried underground to catch anything walking along the ground. Sweet nets in the top right, used to catch things like grasshoppers or butterflies. Transect lines will be where we're studying up a beach or from a tree going out into a field. Kick sampling is what we'll do in rivers in order to see what's actually on the riverbed. And tree beating is where we're going to hold a big white sheet under a tree and shake it in order to see what falls out. Once we've actually collected organisms, we need to identify them. Two ways we can do this. Both are versions of what's called a key. So keys are used to identify organisms based on their characteristics. And the two types we've got in the bottom left is a spider or branched key. And in the bottom right, we've got the numbered key. So all you do is you just start at the top on the numbered key or the branched key and work your way down just answering the questions as you go and following instructions given. One of the key techniques we need to describe is the capture recapture technique. So what we do is we go out and we capture a sample, count them and mark them before releasing them. Then at a later date, we go back to the same area, use the same technique to capture and count the sample once more. So this time we'll have a number that are marked and a number that are unmarked in our second sample. Once we've got that to calculate the total population size, we do the number in the first sample times the number in the second sample divided by the number that were marked in the second sample. A couple of key things to remember that this assumes, number one, that there's been no death between our samples and that there's been no immigration or emigration to the population. When we're thinking about sampling, there are two types, random and non-random. So random sampling is where we'd mark a grid on the sample area using tape measures and then use a random number generator to give us the coordinates to place our quadrat. And the whole idea behind random sampling is that it removes any form of bias. Non-random sampling is where we want to study how distribution changes over a distance. So what we do is we run a transect line along the area being sampled, so from the seashore up the beach, and then we'll place quadrats at set intervals, say every metre along that line, and record what's present to show us how the plants actually change as you move further from the sea. The next topic we're going to look at is biodiversity. When we're talking about biodiversity, we are looking at the variety of living things in an area. And it's essential for maintaining this balanced ecosystem. So the big problem we've got is we exist as human beings, I'm afraid. We are the leading cause of the loss of biodiversity due to our increasing population size in the world today. So a few ways that we're actually impacting on biodiversity. First one, deforestation. So deforestation is the permanent removal of large areas of forest. And the reason that we're doing this is to actually get the materials we need for building, for fuel, to create space for us to put new buildings and roads in, etc. And the big downside is that it's going to reduce the number of trees. So that means we reduce the number of supported animal species. Second one, agriculture. So we're carrying out a lot of intensive farming of land in order to feed this ever growing population. But the downside is that we're losing hedgerows. So that means that we've reduced the number of plant species and the organisms that lived in them. We're also using pesticides, which is going to remove food source for some organisms. And we also get the problem of bioaccumulation of pesticides. 
Plus we could have herbicide use which reduce the number of plant species present which again has the knock-on effect of what other organisms can live there. The third problem we've got is hunting and fishing again to feed our growing population. So what we see here is that if we're overfishing then we've got large decreases in populations or potentially losing a species from an area and there's also the risk of other marine organisms being caught and killed in those nets. If we're hunting it may decrease food for another organism or remove a key part of the food chain. Last one is pollution. So the more polluted an area is the fewer organisms that can survive there and a good example of this is eutrophication which is where the fertilizers run off the fields into rivers and lakes and then that leads to an algal bloom which blocks the light so any plants in the river die and as they're decomposed by the microorganisms the oxygen levels drop leading to the death of all the fish. So two key terms we need to know the meanings of. Endangered is when we've only got a low number of the species left, so they are at risk of becoming extinct. And an extinct species is one where all members of it are dead. So to try to prevent things becoming extinct, we use conservation, which is protecting a natural environment to ensure that habitats are not lost. One of the key ways we do this is through active management of habitats. So this would be things like controlled grazing, restricting human access to it, feeding animals so that their loss of food is counteracted, reintroducing species to the wild when we've carried out captive breeding programs. But the key thing here is that we are still using the resources, but in a sustainable way. We mentioned captive breeding and the whole idea of captive breeding programs is to create a stable and healthy population of a species that can then be gradually reintroduced into their natural habitat. There are a couple of key problems though. Number one, maintaining genetic diversity isn't always easy because we've only got a limited number of breeding partners available. And secondly, organisms that are born in captivity may not be suitable for release. One way we can prevent the extinction of plants is to use seed banks. So what we do there is we store all these seeds in these very deep vaults, sometimes in the very uh, depths of the Arctic Circle. And that means that we can grow that plant in the future. So even if that plant was to go extinct on the surface of the planet, we've got the seed so we can then reintroduce a population later. One of the key things behind this conservation of biodiversity is that we need both local and international cooperation in order to preserve these habitats and individual species. So international organisations help to secure agreements between the different nations. So the IUCN published the Red List, which tells countries about which species need conservation. And then the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna treaty regulates the international trade of wild plants, animals and their products. So we've also got this set of conventions called the Rio Conventions that require countries to develop strategies for sustainable development, to reduce their greenhouse emissions and to combat desertification with the whole overall aim to maintain biodiversity. In terms of what happens locally, then different countries will utilise different schemes within their borders to try to maintain biodiversity. So in England, there are farmers who are offered payments by the government to conserve their landscapes, for example. Another key area we need to be aware of is ecotourism. Now, tourists do bring in money to countries which can be used to extend and improve habitats, to employ people to prevent poaching and maintain biodiversity. Because ecotourism aims to ensure tourism doesn't have a negative impact on the natural environment or the local communities. So the way that this is going to work is we restrict tourists to certain areas. We'll encourage people to keep to footpaths rather than tramping across all the very protected and endangered plants. We try to avoid disturbances to breeding grounds. There are also some downsides to this. So if we're using certain trails, then that repeated use of hiking trails and vehicles on certain areas may contribute to soil erosion. For those of you doing higher biology, you need to know about how we monitor biodiversity. So scientists will regularly take samples of plants and animals from a habitat to monitor the type and number of them present. 
and one of the key types of organisms they're looking for are indicator species which are organisms that we can use to measure environmental quality either through their presence or absence one of the key things we need to monitor is air pollution so one of the most common forms is sulfur dioxide which comes from the combustion of some fossil fuels when sulfur dioxide is released it causes acid rain which can result in the death of fish and trees so the indicator species for our air pollution are lichens now because they've got no root system that means that all of their nutrition comes from the air there are some lichens that cope very well with pollution and they're the ones we find in industrial areas and other species of lichen only grow in areas with clean air so just by looking at what lichens are present we get an idea about the quality of the air in that particular area if we now turn our attention to water pollution then this is most commonly caused by the release of harmful substances into lakes rivers and seas and the higher the pollution level the lower the level of dissolved oxygen so again we've got indicator species that give an idea about the amount of dissolved oxygen present so if we find mayfly larva then we've got very unpolluted water if it's freshwater shrimp there's only low water pollution levels if we find water lice then there's quite high pollution and if there are sludge worms then there's very high pollution in today's chemistry check we're looking at reversible reactions and equilibria so in a reversible reaction the products can react together to form the original reactants so they've got both a forward and backward reaction Make sure you know the symbol for it, which is half an arrow in one direction, half an arrow in the other direction. Giving you an example at the bottom there of a reversible reaction, the forward reaction is the hydrated copper sulfate making copper sulfate and water, and the backwards reaction is copper sulfate and water making hydrated copper sulfate. If we have a closed system, this is one where no substance can enter or leave. So a flask with a stopper in it is a good example here if we've got a reversible reaction occurring in a closed system it will reach equilibrium so that means the rate of the forward and backward reactions are equal so this means the concentrations of all the reacting substances will remain constant now this isn't just a static equilibrium it's a dynamic equilibrium because the forward and backward reactions are still happening it's just they're happening at the same rate so the concentrations remain constant for those of you doing the higher tier you need to know about equilibrium position so the equilibrium position is a description of the relative amounts of reactants and products in a reaction mixture at equilibrium what we find is the equilibrium position is on the left when the concentration of reactants is greater than the concentration of products and the equilibrium position is on the right when the concentration of reactants is less than the concentration of products just remember that that equilibrium position may change if we alter the conditions one of the conditions we could change is the pressure so if we increase the pressure the equilibrium position moves in the direction of the fewest moles of gas so you look at the balanced equation look at the state symbols so we're only concerned with the gas here so in this example we've got three moles of gas on the left two on the right so that means that if we increase the pressure our equilibrium position moves to the right because there are fewer moles of gas there second factor is concentration if we increase the concentration of a substance the equilibrium position moves in the direction away from that substance so whichever one we've increased the concentration of the equilibrium position moves away from it so in this example here if we increase the concentration of our hydrochloric acid then the equilibrium position moves to the right away from the hydrochloric acid the final factor is temperature so if we increase the temperature of a substance the equilibrium position moves in the direction of the endothermic change so in the example here the forward reaction is exothermic and we can tell that because of the minus sign in front of our delta h so that means that the backward reaction is endothermic so if we increase the temperature the equilibrium position in this example moves to the left so if we look at an example of where we choose reaction conditions we've got a balanced equation at the top there 
So if we want to increase the amount of methanol made, we need to move the equilibrium position to the right because that's where our methanol is. So we know increasing the pressure moves the equilibrium position in the direction of the fewest moles of gas. So in this case, we've got three moles of gas on the left and one on the right. So if we increase the pressure, we increase our yield of methanol. However, we need to bear in mind that we don't just keep increasing the pressure endlessly. Usually where we're talking about increasing pressure, we have to make a compromise because of the cost of the equipment and the safety aspects. So when we're talking about high pressures, that needs expensive equipment in order to compress the gas and a reaction vessel that's capable of withstanding these high pressures. It also needs lots of energy to achieve this. So all of that costs money. And what we'll actually do is rather than just spending huge amounts of cash here, we will compromise our pressure to make sure it's high enough to give a reasonable equilibrium yield, but not too high as to be too expensive or hazardous. If we consider the temperature as our example, we can see our forward reaction is exothermic because our delta H is negative, which means the backwards reaction is endothermic. So if we increase the temperature, it will move the equilibrium position to the left, which would decrease our yield of methanol. So that's a bad thing in this case. However, we're not just going to drop the temperature down as low as we possibly can. We're again going to have a compromise. We need it to be low enough to achieve a reasonable equilibrium yield, but not too low. So it's got a very slow rate of reaction. So wherever we're looking at choosing these reaction conditions, the key word is probably going to be compromise. So make sure you say you'd have it either that high or that low in order to move the equilibrium position there, but, and then justify the other side as well. First part of today's physics prep is looking at radiation in the human body. So we're all exposed to radiation all the time, which is the background radiation. So in the pie chart there, we can see the different types, radon, 50%, food and drink, ground and buildings, cosmic rays, artificial sources, medical uses, and then other, which are some of the teeny tiny little things like nuclear weapons and so forth. We need to know two key words in their definitions. Contamination occurs when radioactive material is taken inside the body or on the skin and internal contamination can't be removed. And irradiation occurs when radioactive material is outside your body and the radiation can then travel into your body. The big problem we've got with radiation is that when it enters the body, the DNA inside our cells can be damaged and that can lead to cancer. So if you're only exposed to very small doses of radiation, then the damage that's produced there can usually be repaired by the body. One of the key uses of radiation in terms of the human body is in medical traces. So a radioactive isotope is injected, inhaled or swallowed, and then a gamma camera is used to detect the radiation that's passing out of the body in order to show the problems. Now the radiographer will choose the type of isotope used very carefully to make sure the half-life isn't too short so that it's vanished before they even get the gamma camera out and that it's not too long so that it's not going to be emitting radiation over a much longer period which can cause problems. So they've also got to make sure it's emitting the right type of radiation. It would be a bit pointless giving someone a tracer that's going to emit only alpha radiation because you're not going to pick that up on a camera outside the body. Second use is in a gamma knife. So this is where we've got a movable source of gamma radiation that we're going to move around the body, but keep it focused on our tumor. So it's going to give a high enough dose to kill the tumor cells, but the healthy cells around it get a much lower dose and therefore they don't die. For those of you doing GCSE physics, we need to know about nuclear fission. So unstable nuclei emit radiation as we know and the nucleus will emit alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays, or neutrons, or a combination of the above. Now, nuclear fission is where a large nucleus is split into smaller nuclei and neutrons. So it doesn't occur spontaneously, but if the nucleus absorbs a neutron, then fission is more likely. 
So what we see happening in nuclear fission is the nucleus is going to split to produce two small nuclei and two or three neutrons. So uranium-235 and uranium-239 are fissionable substances, so that means they split easily. Now we'll use this inside nuclear power stations because this fission reaction is going to be generating a lot of energy which we can use to heat the water to produce the steam to drive the turbines which then drive the generators which make the electricity. Now the energy we're transferring to our surroundings via fission is much greater than the energy that's transferred in a combustion reaction so we can generate a huge amount of electricity in a nuclear power station. Because each nucleus that splits releases two or three neutrons, each of those neutrons can then go and trigger other fission reactions. So we build up something called a chain reaction, which is shown in the diagram on the right. First thing to remember, though, is that a chain reaction can only occur if there are enough nuclei around the first nuclei. So that a small mass of radioactive material would result in the neutrons escaping and the reaction stopping. So it's got to be a reasonable mass of our radioactive material present. Second thing we need to know is how we control chain reactions in our nuclear power stations. And we do this through the use of a control rod. So these rods just absorb the extra neutrons to prevent that chain reaction from going further. And the key distinction between our nuclear power station and a nuclear bomb is that in the nuclear bomb we don't have control rods. So there's no control of fission which leads to a huge amount of energy being transferred very quickly. The second type of reaction we need to know about is nuclear fusion. So nuclear fusion is where two lighter nuclei join together to make a more stable nuclei. So fusion is what happens in our sun, where we've got hydrogen nuclei that fuse together to form larger nuclei, like other isotopes of hydrogen or helium. And eventually they will keep fusing and make carbon, oxygen and iron. The energy that we're forming is transferred from a nuclear store by heating and electromagnetic radiation. Big problem we've got with nuclear fusion is that the repulsion caused by both protons being positive has to be overcome for the fusion to actually take place. And the way that we overcome this in the sun is that it's got very high temperatures. So those high temperatures increase the speed at which the nuclei are moving and we've got a high pressure which keeps the nuclei close enough to fuse together. What we do find in terms of our fusion reaction is that the mass of the products of fusion is slightly less than the mass of the reactants. And this change in mass produces a lot of energy in the form of radiation, which we can understand by the good old E equals delta mc squared. You probably know it as E equals mc squared, good old Einstein there. Now the E is the energy, delta m is your change in mass in kilograms, C is our speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second. So you can just substitute in the change in mass and then times that by 300 million meters per second squared. And then that gives you your energy, which, as you can see, is going to be huge. As always, if there have been some items we've gone over that you're not 100 percent certain on, head on over to our playlist to get a more in-depth look at them. So for biology, it was B6. Chemistry is C5. Physics for combined sciences P4 and physics for the separate sciences is the P6 playlist. I've not done a quiz today because yesterday only three people actually did it. So if you are desperate for me to do one of our little multiple choice quizzes, then by all means post a comment and I'll see what I can do. But unless I hear from you, then I'm not going to be doing any more quizzes.